Linguistics is the scientific study of language. It involves an analysis of language form, language meaning, and language in context. Linguistic study was originally motivated by the correct description of classical liturgical language, notably that of Sanskrit grammar in ancient India, or by the development of logic and rhetoric in ancient Greece, leading to a grammatical tradition in Hellenism. Beginning around the 4th century BCE, China also developed its own grammatical traditions. Traditions of Arabic grammar and Hebrew grammar developed during the Middle Ages, also in a religious context. Modern linguistics began to develop in the 18th century with work almost entirely centering around Indo-European studies and leading to a highly elaborate and consistent reconstruction of the Proto-Indo-European language. The first half of the 20th century was marked by the structuralist school, based on the work of Ferdinand de Saussure in Europe and Edward Sapper and Leonard Bloomfield in the United States. The 1960s saw the rise of many new fields in linguistics, such as Noam Chomsky's generative grammar, William Lebeau's sociolinguistics, Michael Halliday's systemic functional linguistics and also modern psycholinguistics. In the early 20th century, de Saussure distinguished between the notions of long and parole in his formulation of structural linguistics. According to him, parole is the specific utterance of speech, whereas long refers to an abstract phenomenon that theoretically defines the principles and system of rules that govern a language. This distinction resembles the one made by Noam Chomsky between competence and performance, where competence is individual's ideal knowledge of a language, while performance is the specific way in which it is used. Antiquity Across cultures, the early history of linguistics is associated with a need to disambiguate discourse, especially for ritual texts or in arguments. This often led to explorations of sound meaning mappings, and the debate over conventional versus naturalistic origins for these symbols. Finally this led to the processes by which larger structures are formed from units. <inaudible> Babylonia The earliest linguistic texts, written in cuneiform on clay tablets, date almost 4,000 years before the present. In the early centuries of the second millennium BCE, in southern Mesopotamia there arose a grammatical tradition that lasted more than 2,500 years. The linguistic texts from the earliest parts of the tradition were lists of nouns in Sumerian a language isolate, that is, a language with no known genetic relatives, the language of religious and legal texts at the time. Sumerian was being replaced in everyday speech by a very different and unrelated language, Akkadian. It remained however as a language of prestige and continued to be used in religious and legal contexts. It therefore had to be taught as foreign language, and to facilitate this, information about Sumerian was recorded in writing by Akkadian-speaking scribes. Over the centuries, the lists became standardized, and the Sumerian words were provided with Akkadian translations. Ultimately texts emerged that gave Akkadian equivalents for not just single words, but for entire paradigms of varying forms for words. One text, for instance, has 227 different forms of the verb gar to place. India Linguistics in ancient India derives its impetus from the need to correctly recite and interpret the Vedic texts. Already in the oldest Indian text, the Rigveda, Vak, speech, is deified. By 1200 BCE, the oral performance of these texts becomes standardized, and treatises on ritual recitation suggest splitting up the Sanskrit compounds into words, stems, and phonetic units, providing an impetus for morphology and phonetics. 
Some of the earliest activities in the description of language have been attributed to the 4th century BCE Indian grammarian Panini, who wrote a formal description of the Sanskrit language in his Astadayi. Over the next few centuries, clarity was reached in the organization of sound units, and the stop consonants were organized in a 5x5 five five square. C. 800 BCE, Pratisakyas, eventually leading to a systematic alphabet, Brahmi, by the 3rd century BCE. In semantics, the early Sanskrit grammarian Sakatayana before c. 500 BCE proposes that verbs represent ontologically prior categories, and that all nouns are etymologically derived from actions. The etymologist Yaska c. 5th century BCE posits that meaning inheres in the sentence, and that word meanings are derived based on sentential usage. He also provides four categories of words nouns, verbs, pre verbs, and particles, invariants and a test for nouns both concrete and abstract, words which can be indicated by the pronoun that. Panini. C. 4th century BCE opposes the Yaska view that sentences are primary, and proposes a grammar for composing semantics from morphemic roots. Transcending the ritual text to consider living language, Panini specifies a comprehensive set of about 4,000 aphoristic rules sutras that map the semantics of verb argument structures into thematic roles. Provide morphosyntactic rules for creating verb forms and nominal forms whose seven cases are called karaka similar to case that generate the morphology. Take these morphological structures and consider phonological processes e.g., root or stem modification by which the final phonological form is obtained in addition. The Paninian school also provides a list of 2,000 verb roots which form the objects on which these rules are applied, a list of sounds the so-called Shiva Sutras, and a list of 260 words not derivable by the rules. The extremely succinct specification of these rules and their complex interactions led to considerable commentary and extrapolation over the following centuries. The phonological structure includes defining a notion of sound universals similar to the modern phoneme, the systematization of consonants based on oral cavity constriction, and vowels based on height and duration. However, it is the ambition of mapping these from morpheme to semantics that is truly remarkable in modern terms. Grammarians following Panini include Katyayana c. 3rd century BCE, who wrote aphorisms on Panini the Vartika and advanced mathematics, Patanjali 2nd century BCE, known for his commentary on selected topics in Panini's grammar the Mahabhasya and on Katyayana's aphorisms, as well as, according to some, the author of the Yoga Sutras, and Pingala, with his mathematical approach to prosody. Several debates ranged over centuries, for example, on whether word meaning mappings were conventional or eternal The Nyaya Sutras specified three types of meaning, the individual this cow, the type universal cowhood, and the image draw the cow. That the sound of a word also forms a class sound universal was observed by Bhartarhari c. 500 CE, who also posits that language universals are the units of thought, close to the nominalist or even the linguistic determinism position. Bhartarhari also considers the sentence to be ontologically primary word meanings are learned given their sentential use. Of the six canonical texts or Vedangas that formed the core syllabus in Brahmanich education from the 1st century CE until the 18th century, four dealt with language Shiksha, Siksa, Phonetics and Phonology, Sandhi, Gargiya and Commentators, Chandas, Chandas, Prosody or Meter, Pingala and Commentators. Vyakarana, Vyakarana, Grammar, Panini and Commentators. 
Nirukta, Nirukta, etymology, Yaska and commentators Bhartrahari around 500 CE introduced a philosophy of meaning with his Svota doctrine. This body of work became known in 19th century Europe, where it influenced modern linguistics initially through Franz Bopp, who mainly looked at Panini. Subsequently, a wider body of work influenced Sanskrit scholars such as Ferdinand de Saussure, Leonard Bloomfield, and Roman Jakobson. Fritz Stahl discussed the possible European impact of Indian ideas on language. After outlining the various aspects of the contact, Stahl posits the theory that the idea of formal rules in language, first proposed by de Saussure in 1894, and finally developed by Chomsky in 1957, based on which formal rules were also introduced in computational languages, may indeed lie in the European exposure to the formal rules of Paninian grammar. In particular, de Saussure, who lectured on Sanskrit for three decades, may have been influenced by Panini and Bhartrahari. His idea of the unity of signifier signified in the sign is somewhat similar to the notion of Svoda. More importantly, the very idea that formal rules can be applied to areas outside of logic or mathematics, may itself have been catalyzed by Europe's contact with the work of Sanskrit grammarians. The Pali grammar of Kashayana, dated to the early centuries CE, describes the language of the Buddhist canon. <inaudible> Greece The Greeks developed an alphabet based on a system previously used by the Phoenicians, adding signs for vowels and for extra consonants appropriate to their idiom see Robbins, 1997. As a result of the introduction of writing, poetry such as the Homeric poems became written and several editions were created and commented on, forming the basis of philology and criticism. Along with written speech, the Greeks commenced studying grammatical and philosophical issues. A philosophical discussion about the nature and origins of language can be found as early as the works of Plato. A subject of concern was whether language was man-made, a social artifact, or supernatural in origin. Plato in his Cratylus presents the naturalistic view, that word meanings emerge from a natural process, independent of the language user. His arguments are partly based on examples of compounding, where the meaning of the whole is usually related to the constituents, although by the end he admits a small role for convention. The Sophists and Socrates introduced dialectics as a new text genre. The Platonic dialogues contain definitions of the meters of the poems and tragedy, the form and the structure of those texts see the Republic and Phaedros, Ion, etc. Aristotle supports the conventional origins of meaning. He defined the logic of speech and of the argument. Furthermore, Aristotle's works on rhetoric and poetics became of the utmost importance for the understanding of tragedy, poetry, public discussions etc. as text genres. Aristotle's work on logic interrelates with his special interest in language, and his work on this area was fundamentally important for the development of the study of language logos in Greek means both language and logic reasoning. In categories, Aristotle defines what is meant by synonymous or univocal words, what is meant by homonymous or equivocal words, and what is meant by paronymous or denominative words. He divides forms of speech as being either simple, without composition or structure, such as man, horse, fights, etc or having composition and structure, such as, a man fights, the horse runs, etc. Next, he distinguishes between a subject of predication, namely that of which anything is affirmed or denied, and a subject of inhesion. A thing is said to be inherent in a subject, when, though it is not a part of the subject, it cannot possibly exist without the subject, e.g., shape in a thing having a shape. 
The categories are not abstract platonic entities but are found in speech, these are substance, quantity, quality, relation, place, time, position, state, action and affection. In De Interpretatione, Aristotle analyzes categoric propositions, and draws a series of basic conclusions on the routine issues of classifying and defining basic linguistic forms, such as simple terms and propositions, nouns and verbs, negation, the quantity of simple propositions, primitive roots of the quantifiers in modern symbolic logic, investigations on the excluded middle which to Aristotle isn't applicable to future tense propositions the problem of future contingents and on modal propositions the stoics made linguistics an important part of their system of the cosmos and the human they played an important role in defining the linguistic sign terms adopted later on by ferdinand de saussure like significant and signifi the Stoics studied phonetics, grammar and etymology as separate levels of study. In phonetics and phonology the articulators were defined. The syllable became an important structure for the understanding of speech organization. One of the most important contributions of the Stoics in language study was the gradual definition of the terminology and theory echoed in modern linguistics. Alexandrian grammarians also studied speech sounds and prosody, they defined parts of speech with notions such as noun, verb, etc. There was also a discussion about the role of analogy in language, in this discussion the Grammatici in Alexandria supported the view that language and especially morphology is based on analogy or paradigm, whereas the Grammatic in schools in Asia Minor consider that language is not based on analogical bases but rather on exceptions. Alexandrians, like their predecessors, were very interested in meter and its role in poetry. The metrical feet in the Greek was based on the length of time taken to pronounce each syllable, with syllables categorized according to their weight as either long syllables or short syllables, also known as heavy and light syllables, respectively, to distinguish them from long and short vowels. The foot is often compared to a musical measure and the long and short syllables to whole notes and half notes. The basic unit in Greek and Latin prosody is a mora, which is defined as a single short syllable. A long syllable is equivalent to two moras. A long syllable contains either a long vowel, a diphthong, or a short vowel followed by two or more consonants. Various rules of elision sometimes prevent a grammatical syllable from making a full syllable, and certain other lengthening and shortening rules such as corruption, can create long or short syllables in contexts where one would expect the opposite. The most important classical meter as defined by the Alexandrian grammarians was the dactylic hexameter, the meter of Homeric poetry. This form uses verses of six feet. The first four feet are normally dactyls, but can be spondees. The fifth foot is almost always a dactyl. The sixth foot is either a spondee or a troche. The initial syllable of either foot is called the ictus, the basic beat of the verse. There is usually a caesura after the ictus of the third foot. Subsequently, the text Tecna Grammaticae c. 100 BCE, GK, Gramma meant letter, and this title means, Art of Letters, possibly written by Dionysus Thrax 170-90 BCE, lists eight parts of speech and lays out the broad details of Greek morphology including the case structures. This text was intended as a pedagogic guide, as was Panini, and also covers punctuation and some aspects of prosody. Other grammars by Charisius, mainly a compilation of Thrax, as well as lost texts by Remius Palaemon and others, and Diomedes, focusing more on prosody, were popular in Rome as pedagogic material for teaching Greek to native Latin speakers. 
One of the most prominent scholars of Alexandria and of the antiquity was Apollonius de Scolis. Apollonius wrote more than thirty treatises on questions of syntax, semantics, morphology, prosody, orthography, dialectology, and more. Happily, four of these are preserved. We still have a syntax in four books, and three one-book monographs on pronouns, adverbs, and connectives, respectively. Lexicography become an important domain of study as many grammarians compiled dictionaries, thesauri and lists of special words, lexies, that were old, or dialectical or special, such as medical words or botanic words, at that period. In the early medieval times we find more categories of dictionaries like the Dictionary of Sweden considered the first encyclopedic dictionary, etymological dictionaries etc. At that period, the Greek language functioned as a lingua franca, a language spoken throughout the known world for the Greeks and Romans of that time and, as a result, modern linguistics struggles to overcome this. With the Greeks a tradition commenced in the study of language. The Romans and the medieval world followed, and their laborious work is considered today as a part of our everyday language. Think, for example, of notions such as the word, the syllable, the verb, the subject etc. Topic. Rome In the 4th century, Aelius Donatus compiled the Latin grammar Ars Grammatica that was to be the defining school text through the Middle Ages. A smaller version, Ars Minor, covered only the eight parts of speech. Eventually when books came to be printed in the 15th century, this was one of the first books to be printed. Schoolboys subjected to all this education gave us the current meaning of grammar. Attested in English since 1176. Topic: <inaudible> China. Similar to the Indian tradition, Chinese philology, Shaoshui, Shao elementary studies, began as an aid to understanding classics in the Han Dynasty, c. 3rd century BCE. Shaoshui came to be divided into three branches, Zunggu, Shuan, exegesis, Wenzi, Wen, script analysis, and Yinyan, yin yin, study of sounds, and reached its golden age in the 17th century CE Qing dynasty. The glossary area, c. 3rd century BCE, comparable to the Indian Nyantu, is regarded as the first linguistic work in China. Xuan Jiezi, c. 2nd century BCE, the first Chinese dictionary, classifies Chinese characters by radicals, a practice that would be followed by most subsequent lexicographers. Two more pioneering works produced during the Han Dynasty are Fangyan, the first Chinese work concerning dialects, and Shiming, devoted to etymology. As in ancient Greece, early Chinese thinkers were concerned with the relationship between names and reality. Confucius 6th century BCE famously emphasized the moral commitment implicit in a name, Zhengming stating that the moral collapse of the pre-Qin was a result of the failure to rectify behavior to meet the moral commitment inherent in names. Good government consists in the ruler being a ruler, the minister being a minister, the father being a father, and the son being a son. If names be not correct, language is not in accordance with the truth of things. Analects 12.11, 13.3. However, what is the reality implied by a name? The later Mohists are the group known as School of Names, Ming Jia, 479 to 221 BCE. Consider that Ming name may refer to three kinds of Shi actuality type universals horse individual john and unrestricted thing they adopt a realist position on the name reality connection universals arise because 
the world itself fixes the patterns of similarity and difference by which things should be divided into kinds. The philosophical tradition is well known for conundra resembling the sophists, e.g. when Gongsun Longzi 4th century BCE questions if in copula statements x is y, are x and y identical or is x a subclass of y. This is the famous paradox. A white horse is not a horse. Xuan Zi 3rd century BCE revisits the principle of Jungming, but instead of Rectifying behavior to suit the names, his emphasis is on Rectifying language to correctly reflect reality. This is consistent with a more conventional view of word origins The study of phonology in China began late, and was influenced by the Indian tradition, after Buddhism had become popular in China. The rhyme dictionary is a type of dictionary arranged by tone and rhyme, in which the pronunciations of characters are indicated by fanch spellings. Rhyme tables were later produced to aid the understanding of fanch. Philological studies flourished during the Qing dynasty, with Duan Yukai and Wang Nianzun as the towering figures. The last great philologist of the era was Zhang Binglin, who also helped lay the foundation of modern Chinese linguistics. The Western comparative method was brought into China by Bernard Carlgren, the first scholar to reconstruct Middle Chinese and Old Chinese with Latin alphabet not IPA. Important modern Chinese linguists include Y. R. Chao, Luo Changpei, Li Fangyi and Wang Li. The ancient commentators on the classics paid much attention to syntax and the use of particles. But the first Chinese grammar, in the modern sense of the word, was produced by Ma Jianzhong late 19th century. His grammar was based on the Latin prescriptive model. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Middle Ages. Topic. Arabic grammar Due to the rapid expansion of Islam in the 8th century, many people learned Arabic as a lingua franca. For this reason, the earliest grammatical treatises on Arabic are often written by non-native speakers. The earliest grammarian who is known to us is Abd Allah ibn Abi Ishaq al-Hadrami died 735 to 736 CE, 117 AH. The efforts of three generations of grammarians culminated in the book of the Persian linguist Sabawayhai c. 760 to 793. Sabawai made a detailed and professional description of Arabic in 760 in his monumental work, Al Kitab fi al Nahw, Al Tab fi al Nyaw, the book on grammar. In his book, he distinguished phonetics from phonology. <laughs> <laughs> European vernaculars The Irish Sanas Cormaic Cormax Glossary is Europe's first etymological and encyclopedic dictionary in any non-classical language. The Medeste or speculative grammarians in the 13th century introduced the notion of universal grammar. In De Vulgari Eloquentia, on the eloquence of vernacular. Dante expanded the scope of linguistic enquiry from Latin, Greek to include the languages of the day. Other linguistic works of the same period concerning the vernaculars include the first grammatical treatise Icelandic or the Oricept na en eches Irish. The Renaissance and Baroque period saw an intensified interest in linguistics, notably for the purpose of Bible translations by the Jesuits, and also related to philosophical speculation on philosophical languages and the origin of language. <laughs> Modern linguistics 
Modern linguistics did not begin until the late 18th century, and the romantic or animist theses of Johann Gottfried Herder and Johann Christoph Adeling remained influential well into the 19th century. Topic: <laughs> Historical linguistics. During the 18th century conjectural history, based on a mix of linguistics and anthropology, on the topic of both the origin and progress of language and society was fashionable. These thinkers contributed to the construction of academic paradigms in which some languages were labeled primitive relative to the English language. Within this paradigm a primitive people could be discerned by their primitive language, as in the case of Hugh Blair who argued that Native Americans gesticulated wildly to compensate for poor lexicon of their primitive language. Around the same time, James Burnett authored a six-volume treatise that delved more deeply into the matter of savage languages. Other writers theorized that Native American languages were nothing but the natural and instinctive cries of the animal, without grammatical structure. The thinkers within this paradigm connected themselves with the Greeks and Romans, viewed as the only civilized persons of the ancient world, a view articulated by Thomas Sheridan who compiled an important 18th-century pronunciation dictionary. It was to the care taken in the cultivation of their languages, that Greece and Rome, owed that splendor, which eclipsed all the other nations of the world. In the 18th century James Burnett, Lord Monbado analyzed numerous languages and deduced logical elements of the evolution of human language. His thinking was interleaved with his precursive concepts of biological evolution. Some of his early concepts have been validated and are considered correct today. In his The Sanskrit Language 1786, Sir William Jones proposed that Sanskrit and Persian had resemblances to Classical Greek, Latin, Gothic, and Celtic languages. From this idea sprung the field of comparative linguistics and historical linguistics. Through the 19th century, European linguistics centered on the comparative history of the Indo-European languages, with a concern for finding their common roots and tracing their development. In the 1820s, Wilhelm von Humboldt observed that human language was a rule-governed system, anticipating a theme that was to become central in the formal work on syntax and semantics of language in the 20th century. Of this observation he said that it allowed language to make infinite use of finite means. Uber den dualis, 1827. Humboldt's work is associated with the movement of Romantic linguistics, which was inspired by nature philosophy and Romantic science. Other notable representatives of the movement include Carl Wilhelm Friedrich Schlegel and Franz Bopp. It was only in the late 19th century that the neogrammarian approach of Karl Brugmann and others introduced a rigid notion of sound law. Historical linguistics also led to the emergence of the semantics and some forms of pragmatics. Nerlich, 1992, Nerlich and Clark, 1996. Topic. Structuralism In Europe there was a development of structural linguistics, initiated by Ferdinand de Saussure, a Swiss professor of Indo-European and general linguistics, whose lectures on general linguistics, published posthumously by his students, set the direction of European linguistic analysis from the 1920s on. His approach has been widely adopted in other fields under the broad term, structuralism. Topic. Descriptive linguistics During the Second World War, North American linguists Leonard Bloomfield, William Mandeville Austin and several of his students and colleagues developed teaching materials for a variety of languages whose knowledge was needed for the war effort. 
This work led to an increasing prominence of the field of linguistics, which became a recognized discipline in most American universities only after the war. In 1965, William Stokoe, a linguist from Gallaudet University published an analysis one, which proved that American Sign Language fits the criteria for a natural language. <laughs> Generative linguistics other subfields From roughly 1980 onwards, pragmatic, functional, and cognitive approaches have steadily gained ground, both in the United States and in Europe. See also History of grammar History of communication equals equals notes. <laughs>